people are under the assumption that for some reason you are able to run your engine wide open throttle all the time which is just unrealistic. After hundreds of downloads that I've looked at, usually what I see is that people run their engine wide open throttle less than 20% of the time. Christopher Williams, can you talk about running an outboard wide open throttle in the future? When I had my power head replaced on my Mercury four stroke, the Marina told me it's best to run it as close to 6,000 RPM, which I've been doing after I broke it in. Now I have people telling me I'm prematurely wearing out my new power head. I was always taught running it in its max RPM range prevents carbon buildup. So yeah, that is true. And I think there might be some kind of a misconception here because for one, you're not prematurely wearing out the power head running in a wide open throttle. That's kind of the biggest differences between an outboard or a marine engine compared to a car engine. Your car engine is meant to run at, you know, 2,500, 3,000 RPM down the highway doing 90, no problems. Whereas your outboards are designed for higher RPMs and they like to run in that range because that does burn the carbon away. But I think that people are under the assumption that for some reason you are able to run your engine wide open throttle all the time which is just unrealistic. I mean, I've looked at hundreds of downloads and literally I would say the majority, if not 90% of them, at least 50% of the RPMs are below 3000 RPM. We're talking about the runnability of your engine and how long can you run at what RPMs? Most people by and large, when they run your boat, when you take into account you know, at the ramp time, idle time, troll time, bottom fish time, um, puts in around the canals time, no wake zones, trolling, going to your spots, stuff like that. Usually what, after hundreds of downloads that I've looked at, usually what I see is that people run their engine wide open throttle less than 20% of the time. So out of, let's say an engine that has a thousand hours just to make it easy. The RPM at wide open throttle is generally less than 20 to 30% of that thousand hours on the engine. And that is why everybody always tells you to run your engines at wide open throttle because nobody does. Everybody runs them in these, you know, these lower RPM ranges, idle time at the ramp, idle time in the no wake zone trolling time while you're trolling out there, you know, getting to a spot, anchoring up, stuff like that. You're running your engine at lower RPM, which is where the carbon buildup comes in. And that's why we tell you run the engine wide open throttle. So that way, when you do have the chance to run wide open throttle, so like say you're cruising into the inlet or wherever you're going and you have a good three, four mile stretch where you can actually hit wide open throttle, then you want to hit that because then all the carbon that you built up while you're out there trolling and putzing around and doing all these other things that gives the engine a chance to heat up, burn off that carbon and, you know, clean itself out. I mean, you're not prematurely wearing out the power head. It's just, it's just not possible. I mean, unless you live somewhere where you have the ability to run 6,000 RPMs everywhere you go, um, you're not, you're not pretty, it, there, it's just, there's just no way. It's, it's, it's not mathematically possible <laughs> unless you live somewhere where you can run 6,000 or 100 RPMs everywhere, everywhere you go For, from the time you put it in at the ramp, you're able to get up on plane, do 6,000 RPM and make it to wherever you're trying to go and then stop, shut everything off and then boom, hop up 6,000 back. It's and not only that, but the, the water conditions also dictate dictates a lot of your speed. I mean, by and large, if you're going offshore, there's not that many days where you actually can run constantly 6,000, 6,400, whatever your wide open is for your engine. There's not that many days that you can run that. So the thought that you're going to prematurely wear out the, wear out the engine because you are running wide open. Um, if you pull the download and you look at the, the actual data of how, how much time is spent at that top RPM range, it's going to be a lot less than you think it is. 
Now, if you're talking about like a race engine or a race boat, stuff like that, where you're actually using the boat for racing and you're running, you know, as close to wide open throttle as possible, that's a whole different discussion. But for the recreational person, no, you, you should try and run wide open in order to, you know, get the, get the engine temp up, oil temp up, um, open up the thermostats, get water flow through the engine, burn off any carbon. Um, it's just, it is good for the engine. By and large, 80% of the time of an engine's life is going to be spent below that range. And so that's kind of my thoughts on it in, in the discussion. I think that could be had about running the engine wide open throttle compared to how much you really are running wide open. Hull Healer's Boat Works Restoration. When I turn on my key, I do not hear the pump inside the VST. He said VAT, but VST vapor separator tank kicking on. Could there be something I need to do first before I do the steps in this video? I am a fiberglass and refinishing guy and only touch my own outboard and I'm having issues on my personal boat. Any tips on how or what to, what to voltmeter test before going through taking my VST apart? So in this one, um, yeah, I would, I would try and turn your key on. So you're going to have wires going into your VST that are going to supply the power to the VST pump your high pressure pump, your low pressure pump, all that kind of stuff, depending, did he say what kind of engine? He did not say what kind of engine, but if you've got an electric low pressure pump and an electric high pressure pump, those are the two pumps that are going to be getting power and you're going to want to check for voltage going to those. Now, the way most systems work, pretty much most outboards, you're going to have a time when you turn the key on, it's going to supply power to that high pressure pump and that low pressure pump for roughly five seconds for most brands. And that is going to basically prime up the fuel system. And then it's going to have that high pressure pump create fuel pressure at the rail of the, you know, for your injectors. What then is going to happen if you don't try and start the engine and you don't get that start command when you turn the key and try and start the engine, the computer is going to stop supplying power to that pump. So you're gonna lose that 12 volts. So when you do go to check for battery voltage at your fuel pump, you're going to want to check it immediately when you turn the key on or have someone cycling the key for you or be able to see the meter whenever you do cycle the key to see that power. Cause again, it's going to come on and it's going to come off. And then when you're trying to start the engine, it should be supplying that power there. Generally you're going to see battery voltage, which is somewhere around 12 volts maybe 11 and a half, maybe 12, maybe 12.5, you know, whatever the battery is, that's what you should be seeing there that is getting supplied to that pump. And then usually, yeah, you get a bad batch of gas and um, you'll have to change out the fuel pump because either you got water in the fuel or the engine sat for a long time and the fuel pump locked itself up. So generally unless you've got a problem with a blown fuse or something like that. If the, if the fuel pump locks up, I forgot to tell you that you should check the fuse going to your fuel pump and see if that is not blown. Cause if the fuel pump locked up, it's, it could be a dead short. And then that would just pop the fuse that supplies the power to your fuel pump. Make sure that's not popped. And again, you might have to mess with the fuel pump to replace it. So, um, Brandon Power Stroke, Dusky 256, 278, great riding boat for the price. Last week we talked about, um, you know, basically the top, top brands that hold their value for the longest or what boats I would say are the best to restore, like something that's going to hold its value and have some resale value after you get done with the restoration. I didn't say Dusky. I probably should have. I am a huge Dusky fan. They are probably one of the most underrated boats on the market, honestly for the price that you spend on a Dusky and the ride that you get, um, the fit and finish is a lot less. So these boats are a little bit more rugged. They're not, you know, flashy like a Pursuit, a Tiara, a Scout, um, CV, anything like that. They're not as flashy. So the finish is a little bit rougher, but the ride of the hull is phenomenal. I mean, they are a, they're a wonderful riding hull and they also, um, they're a, they're a dry boat, great offshore fishing boat. They're set up really nice for fishing. And again, the price point for what you get is, is really 
really good. I mean, it's it's basically priced like it's a massive production boat, but it's not. So I honestly love a Dusky. I think they are, like I said, an underrated boat. So anybody that goes out and if you're looking for a boat, I would take a look at Dusky, depending on what you're wanting to do with it. Sea Shoes, as a person that has rebuilt many boats and built several off-road rigs and cars, the moral of the story is to be a parts hoarder. Just look at how much time and money you save from keeping things. This was a cool series, man. So thank you, uh, Mr. Shoes. The uh, Bully Netter, yeah. The, I mean, most of the restorations that we've done, we've done quite a few now. And yeah, I'm, I'm a parts hoarder. I stack the stuff up. And... Um, yeah, you kind of have to. If you're going to be trying to make money or like flipping boats or working on boats or stuff like that, or cars or anything for that matter, you kind of need to be a parts order and start stacking stuff up. You know, I mean, like GPS stuff, electrical stuff, wiring, connectors, um, battery switches, all that kind of stuff. A lot of times if you work on a boat professionally, which we're working on this in our boaters program. We've got a lot of questions about people wanting to become a mechanic or kids in high school, or um, we had a father wanted to know what his son should do if he should send him to a vocational school. And so we've actually been creating a course within the boaters program to teach you how to become a mechanic in different ways, how much you're going to get paid, what the work's like, what the different routes that you can go into are. And so if you're going to be working in the field as a mechanic, you work on hundreds of boats a week, hundreds of boats, I mean, not, not a week, but I mean, hundreds, hundreds of boats a year, and you start to accumulate all kinds of stuff. And then if you're going to restore a boat, like you said, man, I mean, you save so much money by hoarding parts and like keeping good parts. So that way, whenever you go to do the redo, um, I mean, you can save thousands of dollars just on all the stuff that you have that you didn't have to go out and buy. and I mean, the parts are good, so why wouldn't you? Mr. Chili, can you talk about the relay ECM issue solved? Question mark. So, yeah, I can. Uh, I'm actually in the process of finishing that video for that the main channel. And, um, yeah, we ended up putting a relay that controls for the, the aftermarket pump. The aftermarket pump pulled more amps than the OEM pump. OEM pump was $706 and the aftermarket pump was only 36 bucks, but it fried my ECM. That was $1,200. And if you do any kind of research on that problem, it's a very common problem, even though I've done four or five aftermarket fuel pumps, because that's the most expensive thing. I mean, you, you start opening up these VSTs and these FSMs and stuff, you find out that these fuel pumps from Mercury, Yamaha, Suzuki, all these companies, they're pretty expensive. I mean, I know whenever I did the VST, I needed the high pressure pump for the VST on the 300 HPDI. I ended up getting that pump for 80 bucks where Yamaha wanted $806 for that pump. And it's like, I mean, $800 is a lot of money for a fuel pump. And especially like the 25 that I did that they wanted $700 for that fuel pump. I mean, it's, a, it's an engine that's worth $2,000. So when you got to spend half the value of the engine on one fuel pump, it kind of hurts. So we ended up putting a relay. The ECM is what controls the fuel pump and that amp draw of the aftermarket fuel pump was way higher. It was double basically what the OEM pump was. And so I took a relay and made the ECM control a relay. And then the relay supplied power to the pump. And yeah, I haven't had any trouble since then. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's solved. James, I can use ATF fluid in my C-Star steering system. And don't we all pay too much in time and money on our boats? Absolutely true. Spend way too much time and money on a boat. And, yeah, ATF, you can use ATF. It's just a hydraulic fluid in your steering system. You got hydraulic steering. So hydraulic fluid in the hydraulic steering system, you're fine. If it's a newer system, I don't really put ATF in newer stuff. So if you got power steering or you've got a um, newer system where you've still got the clear fluid in there, I wouldn't put ATF in there just because it's it's newer. I'd keep the clear stuff in there because it's it's better. But if you got an older hydraulic steering system, putting ATF in there is not a problem. Pretty much most of those systems are all full of ATF by now because it's five bucks a bottle, uh, opposed to twenty thirty dollars for 
the really good stuff. 1972 MDC, your fuel pump draw is what scares me about non-OEM parts. I hate overpaying for parts, but something like that can be a buy once, cry once versus cry over and over again. Thanks for the breakdown. Yep. Um, ended up buying an $820 ECU and I was only able to get it for $820 because, you know, I've, I worked at a Mercury dealer for, for over 10 years now. So, um, you know, I kind of got the hookup on that because originally, if you look around, the only other price you're going to get is like $1,200. So that was kind of an issue. Captain Ace High, no one buys a boat to save money. I wonder what he has coming down the pipeline next. Hopefully a nighttime lobster session with Catch and Cook. Um, nope, I haven't. I, I actually didn't get much bully netting in um, this season. Just the weather's been terrible. And I mean, that's been the case for most people that are out there bully netting right now. But uh, the next thing coming down the pike, we actually have quite a few different projects. One of them, our next restoration project is actually a hurricane boat. It's a 17 foot Key West that went through Hurricane Ian, washed up into the mangroves. And so we're going to be doing a full rewire on that and doing a couple changes, moving batteries around, battery switches, redoing the dash, all that kind of stuff. So that is going to be the next boat that we got coming at you okay i have a 2015 yamaha 150 that has intermittent overheating only went out of the water while flushing with muffs or a larger trash can of water just had the impeller replaced and thermostat looked at by my service guy took the boat out last weekend ran fine and cooled fine with good telltale got home was flushing and no telltale and began to overheat with muffs and in the trash can with water a couple of weeks ago i did get in shallow water with sand overheated service guy pulled pump apart and found impeller in pieces was replaced and and ran great but for some reason when flushing i can i get no cooling out the telltale thermostat area seems fine no sand but a small amount of corrosion i'm going to pull thermostat off again today to see if i get flow there could there be some sort of other blockage frustrating any ideas i kind of honestly think you might just be going down a road that you don't need to go down you're just chasing a rabbit because even if you put there's a lot of outboards that if you put them in a trash can and put muss on them they won't they won't have the right amount of pressure via being the back pressure from the trash can and even the water pressure from the hose going in through the muffs sometimes that's not enough pressure for you to be able to run the engine for that long of time on a hose you might be chasing a rabbit because when you put the boat in the water once it's got the weight of the boat in the water and the engine has this massive volume of water around it to be pushing that up and you turn the engine on, the impeller has enough water and back pressure on it that it is able to completely fill the power head with water, go into the, your cooling passages, the thermostat, the whole nine yards, So, um, and you're peeing fine. There's a lot of engines out there that you do not have enough pressure with them being in the trash can on the hose to fill the power head and for them to pee and for you to be able to run them and then give you a good water out the telltale. So if you don't have any cooling problems and you um, have a good telltale while you're running the engine, then I don't think I would worry about it because you're just trying to solve a problem that you might not really have. Um, looking at your temperature on the gauge while you're running the boat as long as you're not getting hot then and you've got water flowing out the tail tail especially on a 150 um you know that that goes through everything by the time it gets out the tail tail so you you might be chasing a rabbit eab i own a 200 horsepower yamaha i fix my plug tail tail with a torch nozzle cleaner they are very handy. Also, the cleaning barbs are different diameter sizes. Yeah, that's a lot of the case, too, where you've got either a mud dauber or you pick up a little piece of sand or a piece of salt or a piece of coral or a piece of dirt, anything that you pick up, and it can get in there. Right at the end of the telltale, there is, you know, the, there's a little barb where the water comes out with the telltale, and the hose goes over that barb, and so now you've got this little lip in there that will you know, it'll catch stuff. So keeping a piece of something like a torch cleaner, you can stick that up in there and it dislodges whatever's there. And a lot of times that's enough for it to push it out and get it, you know, over the nipple or the barb of your telltale output and 
get rid of the blockage so it will start peeing again. Ken Clegg, I like the pipe tool pressure trick. So, I mean, that ain't much of a trick. It's just straight up gravity. We're talking about emptying out a trim system. A lot of times what I like to do to get rid of any kind of water or anything that's in a trim unit, whenever you're doing, um, so you got to do your caps, the seals, the rams, anything on a trim unit. A lot of times it's good to go ahead and suck out any of the fluid that is in that unit while you got the caps off and you got the rams out in order to get new fresh fluid in there and, you know, make sure you got good clean fluid in there. And so a nice little trick is basically just gravity. You put a hose in there. I like to use the hose that comes with the steering cylinder kits. It's just a clear hose that come with a steering cylinder when you get them but it's far enough where you can put it down in the unit, bend it down to where the end of it is below the trim unit, and then just take a ketchup bottle and um, squeeze it in there and let it go. So that way it creates a siphon, starts to suck the fluid. As soon as the fluid gets to the bottom, you take the little bottle away and it will gravity feed and suck out all the old fluid that is in the trim unit. So nice little trick to know about. A game make no 17. I have two 350 Verados. Should I need two steering cylinders? Um, I'm not really sure anymore. I've seen so many 350 Verados that where they got twins and there's only one steering cylinder. I mean, the, it was documented that you needed to have two steering cylinders on any 350 over. So if you had a 350 or 400 L6 and you had twins, yeah, they did require you to have two steering cylinders, one on each outboard. I've seen so many boats now that only have one on there. So there might've been a service Bolton where they said that you don't need two anymore. But for me, I'm going to say, yeah, I would go to, I would want to have two of them on there just because that's what it used to be. And, and I haven't seen anything that changes that yet. So maybe there is something, because like I said, I have seen a lot of boats out there that have twins and only have one steering cylinder on there compared to having two but it's also going to play into the weight of the boat. So the heavier the boat and the more it's going to, you know, be strenuous on the steering system. Um, having two is going to help with that. But one thing that you should know about is the helm. So there's two different types of helms. One is a 40 CC, one is a 50 CC. And I'm pretty sure, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure that the 40 CC is, is basically for one steering cylinder. And that gives you, I think, six turns lock to lock, meaning you can turn the steering wheel six turns. And then the 50 CC is for twin steering cylinders or double steering cylinders. And that one is, I think, like four, four and a half lock to lock. So if you've got a 40 CC, um, that might be something to think about if you've got two, I, I don't know what you're really trying to do here. Or, you know, if you've got, you know, a 350, if you got twin three fifties and only one steering cylinder and you're not sure if you should have two or not, you know, I'm not sure your situation, but that's kind of off the top of my head. What I can think about the Ben Bayer. Do you need one of the stabilizer shock absorber mounts for the head? while running with a shaft that long, just curious, talking about trolling motors. So now you got 108 inch, 96 inch. I mean, you got these really, really super long trolling motors. Yes, you do. I mean, you need to have a head stabilizer on there, something that will attach the gunnel of the boat and then be able to give you support on the head of the trolling motor. So that way, while you're going through the water, that trolling motor is not just bouncing up and down and, and doing this and um, creating more stress than it needs to be. And then also the stress on the actual unit up in the front where it's bolted, you're going to create all kinds of gel coat cracks and stuff like that, because it's just, you know, you're, you're putting tension using leverage. So yeah, I would definitely, definitely you need a, a head stabilizer, shock absorber, whatever they really call those things. They pretty much all come with them. And if not, sometimes you need to get a longer one. There's different sizes depending on where the trolling motor is and how it's being used. But yeah, definitely need one. Dean Travis, no old Makos. So I guess we're going back to the boats that we restored. And yeah, Makos weren't on the list. Um, they probably should have been there. That's like early, you know, late 70s, early, early 80s, or all throughout the 80s. And then early 90s, um, Makos, wonderful boat before they got bought by Bass Pro. Those boats are super desirable. 
a lot of transoms need done. And um, yeah, I mean, they, they do hold their value. Great riding boat. I actually, I mean, I did a 21 Mako back in 2014, 15, somewhere on there, you know, I know, like eight years ago, I did a 21 Mako with a bracket 250 ocean pro. Um, I love that boat. I mean, it was a, they ride great. They hold their value. They look clean. Um, most of them only need a transom. Some of them need to have stringers done, but by and large, most of them need a fuel tank and need a transom. So yeah, I, I think Mako's are a great one to put on that list. The issue is that I had to whittle down that list. I mean, I couldn't have a list of 400 boats. So, I mean, I left a lot of them off. I left the Duskies off. I left the Bertrams off. I left the, um, Mako's off. I mean, I, I left C hunters off. I left, um, C crafts off. Like there's a bunch of boats that got left off, which I think I got a lot of comments on that coming up. Stella Maris, Stella Maris two fishing. Personally, I'd add all Janice era black fins. 31 Bertram's Potter Seacraft and Arano Formula 233 to the list. There you go. All those boats I was just talking about, you know, Bertram's hundred um, percent. I'm, I'm not really the biggest Blackfin fan, but yeah, they're, they are a desirable haul. Like I said, I'm not a Grady White fan or a Parker fan, but they're good boats. They hold their value and everybody loves them. The Seacrafts, I mean, there's tons of those out there and people love them the is the 23s like and then yeah the formula 233 formula great boat so yeah all those are are really good manuel fuertes what do you think of sea hunter boats i mean i like them i like the older ones better so the older ones that were like all kevlar that the one that they dropped that um like 2007 that thing weighed like 7000 pounds it was a 36 i mean that boat was outstanding now they're really heavier and um i mean still a great boat not not dogging on them they got a lot of cool stuff coming out that cat the 41 like all that stuff but for how heavy the boat is they just they ride like a tank i mean they're they're a big boat and i really didn't i wasn't a big fan of that 41 when they were getting into that larger era. So like they, they had a 41 that had trips on it. Like I seen quite a few of those 41s with like triple L six, three fifties or four hundreds. I mean, that boat was way too big to have that little amount of power. I mean, it needed quads on it. All the other boats, all the yellow fins, all the CVs, all, all the other ones had quads on their 39s and up and sea hunter had that one that was had triple engines on it. Um, that boat was just way too heavy. It was, it was like 22,000 pounds. And then once you loaded it, it was like 25,000 pounds. And now you're trying to push that 25,000 pounds with three, 350, 400 Verados. I mean, it was just too heavy for that little amount of power, but I would really like to see that 41 with a triple set of six hundreds now, or even, or even a triple set of the five hundreds. I think putting the four, the V10 400s on that 41 might be a little bit of a stretch, but I would be interested to see how it performs. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, a great boat. I'm a bigger fan of the older sea hunters. Like I said, the, the fully, the Kevlar one, Mike Lowell, in my opinion, no boats hold their value like older Hell's Bay and Maverick skiffs. If you bought one in 2000 for 20, 30 grand and kept it nice, it'd be worth 30, 40 grand today. That's true. I mean, I even talked about Mavericks being on there. I mean, Mavericks, Hughes, the Hell's Bays, those are, those are great skiffs. I mean, for in the flats boat world, a lot of the lists that I was talking about in that video were center consoles and that kind of deal. Not really flats boats, Bertram being cutty cabins or, you know, sport fish style boats. I didn't really get into that, but yeah, I mean, a Hell's Bay and a Maverick. I mean, Maverick's probably one of my favorite. I don't know. It, it's definitely a competition between a Hughes and a Maverick. Those are probably my two favorite flats boats. Cap Pepin, no mention of the 23 Seacraft. Yep, the Seacraft. Everybody loves the Seacraft. I know. I mean, I, I should have put that on the list, but I just, there's too many. There's too many brands. I just couldn't put it on there. Here we go. TK, Blackfins or Bertram and Ocean Master, the best. Um, 
Again, Blackfin, not the biggest fan. Bertram's, love a Bertram. Ocean Master, I did a 23 Ocean Master. Love that boat too. Same thing as the Mako. Um, something else I didn't put on there was a Wellcraft. I did a Wellcraft and I didn't put that on the list because there's a lot of those out there and they they ride really well. I mean, mine, I had the 20 foot Wellcraft and I ended up putting a 250 LX66 on it. So that performed way better because it was way overpowered, but yeah, that's a great little boat too. Same, same thing. The well crafts though, when it comes to like doing bracket conversions and stuff like that, just to, you know, off the top of my head, the, I don't really know how that kind of boat, like the well craft, if that one really performs that well, when you put a bracket on there, whereas like the ocean master, uh, the Makos, Makos get a little stretchy. So some of the Makos will porpoise when you put that bracket on there, but, um, I never tried to do a wellcraft and put a bracket on a wellcraft. I don't know if those would really handle a bracket. They would probably get kind of porpoisey, just like the, the Makos did. But um, the Makos would handle it a lot better, other than something like that. So that is something I wouldn't mind seeing how one of those older wellcrafts would take a bracket, as far as performance wise goes. So Joey the Dime. Just found you guys. Great discussion. Question for you. I have a 2016 Boston Whaler 2010 Montauk with a 2016 Evinrude E-Tech 200 HP HO. I am in Southwest Florida and just can't get any service in my area on the E-Tech. My E-Tech, I mean, that's a big problem all around with any kind of E-Tech. I mean, any BRB product, Evinrude, Johnson, E-Tech, any of that stuff, like the G23s, all that stuff. I mean, Getting service on those things is a problem for a lot of people. So you're not alone in that boat. The 2010 Boston Whaler is a great boat though. My E-Tech needs about $4,000 worth of work, including a new fuel pump reservoir. So I've been thinking about repowering. A Suzuki 200 seems like an interesting option. What are your thoughts? Should I try and get the E-Tech repaired or repower? Um, if it's in the budget, I would repower simply because the E-Tech problem, I mean... For one, okay, you're talking about including a new fuel pump and reservoir. So if you need a new fuel pump, does that mean you need injectors too? Like, is, is there a problem with your injectors too? Because what, you know, what, why did the fuel pump go bad? So if you've got to get into those fuel injectors, whole new problem because the injectors on the E-Tech are serialized and you need a computer in order to just change those out. It's not like any other engine where you can just go in there, take the fuel rail off, and swap out the injectors no big deal on those engines you need to have a computer in order to match the emm and the fuel injector serial numbers and all it's a big deal and so if you need injector work on top of your new fuel pump and the reservoir and all this stuff that might be a bigger problem than what you're thinking of with the four thousand dollars you might need more um so not only that, but you can't get anybody to work on it. So if you can't even get anybody to work on it, you got a problem all already. So I would definitely look into um, doing the repower, the 200 Suzuki. That might be a little light because you're going to lose power going from that two. I think that E-Tech was a V6 and that 200. I'm not sure if that 200 is a four cylinder or the six cylinder, which one you're talking about, but you might lose a little bit of performance and power there going to that. But I would lean into the repower over getting that E-Tech fixed just because there's more problems down the road that you're looking at simply based on what you're telling me with not being able to get anybody to work on it and not, not having any service and then needing fuel problems with the E-Tech. So if you can and it's in the budget, I would look into doing the repower and kind of getting yourself set up to look 10, 15, 20 years into the future without as many problems to deal with as what you might be opening up with your e-tech issue, getting that fixed. I'm going to go ahead and shut it down there. Like we talked about, you know, send us a comment, ask BAB at bornagainboating.com, comment below, try and answer as many of them as we can. If you want to check us out at bornagainboating.com, we do have the boaters program for people that want to be become mechanics or new time boaters that want to gain a ton of experience and save a lot of money, then definitely check us out at bornagainboating.com. We'll see you next week.